Hello, Physics 10. I'm back at, uh, back at my house doing the lectures right here. Uh, I just wanted to do another one on waves. This one, we're going to dwell on, say, sound waves right here. Remember before, the last one, we said transverse waves were like ocean waves. That is, if you looked at, if you threw a little piece of wood out in the water, and as the waves go by, the wood just goes up and down, a little block of wood right here, and the wave moves perpendicular. That's why we called that the transverse wave right here. We could define the wavelength as the distance from, say, a crest to the next crest right there. The frequency is how many of these waves go by every second. And when we multiplied those two quantities together, it gave me the speed of the wave. That's our main wave equation right there. Now, uh, light is a transverse wave, but not sound. Sound is what we call a longitudinal wave right there. That was the other type. I brought out that big slinky and I was kind of pushing at it, but if I wanted to make sound, what I could do is just go like this. You notice when I move my hand like this, I'm compressing the air, decompressing it, compressing it, decompressing it, and those waves take off. And we could say, well, here's the compressed part of the wave right here. This halfway in between would be the uncompressed part right here. And we would call the distance between the two compression parts the wavelength right here. Now you might say, how come I can't hear this? Well, it's because I'm not going fast enough right here. I have to shake my hand at least 20 times per second for me to hear it. Now, what you will notice that uh, if a hummingbird is around, you can hear his wings flapping because they're flapping at least in this, in this range between 20 and to 20,000 right here. Sometimes you can even, at night, you can hear a mosquito. Mosquito flaps their wings about 600 uh, beats per minute or shakes per second, and you can hear 600 hertz uh, sound from the mosquito. Should you be worried if you hear that sound? No, because they don't bite when they're flying. If you don't hear, then I'd worry right here. Okay, so then that's when they're biting. Okay, now sound requires a medium in which to travel. It needs air to travel through. It needs the ground, dirt. It needs some material to, to, to uh, transmit this wave right here. It would not work in a vacuum right here. If you're on the moon, someone's yelling at you right next to you, you won't hear them. You'll be able to see them. Light doesn't require a medium. That's the strange thing. We can see the sun and there's nothing between us and the sun. It's a vacuum right here. But if the sun made noise, we would not hear it right here. Uh, now, uh, not only that, the sound, the speed of sound right here is about 340 meters per second. That's the speed of air. And if you warm up the air, it gets a little bit faster right there. Now, in water, since water is much more rigid, the speed of sound in water is much faster. It's like five times faster than in air. And actually, we could hear much better underwater than we can above water. Next time you're in the bathtub, put your head under the water and just tap the side of the tub and you'll hear it crystal clear right there, much better than if there was no water in there. That's why when the posse's after you, you always stick your ear to the ground. You can hear them through the ground a lot further than through the air. Air is, does not transmit sound very fast, it's very slow, and it's not very efficient. The problem with underwater is you just can't talk very well. You can hear really well, but you just can't talk very well. Right here. Now, our range of hearing is about 20 shakes per second to about 20,000 shakes per second. Now, since we know the frequency and we know the speed, I guess we could get the wavelength. For, for these longest wavelengths, they're about 17 meters long. That's pretty big. That's bigger than the classroom right there. All the way down to that this highest frequency, that's about 17 centimeters, that's about this big. When the smallest wavelength of sound we can hear is about that big, right there. Uh, and, okay, so now bats, 
they can hear much higher frequencies than us. They can hear up to 120,000. That's six times higher than we do. And not only that, they send off these little squeaks at, at that frequency. Why do they do that? Well, they're in the dark all the time. They use it to bounce off of the walls or off of other animals, comes back to them, and they can tell if they're heading towards something. And if they are, they can kind of move out of the way right there. Now, bats, they use it to find insects too right there. Well, if you plug in, since, since this frequency is like six times bigger than this one, that means that the wavelength is about six times smaller. It's about three millimeters, about that big right there. And the thing is, they would not be able to see anything smaller than their wavelength. So, so if the bug is smaller than that big, he cannot be seen right here. So if you're a bug out there, you don't want to gain a lot of weight because once you get big enough, bigger than three millimeters in size, bats can pick you out and then eat you right there. So, but they can't see anything smaller than their wavelength right here. Well, since sound does go faster in hot air, when the ground is hot, remember dirt has a low specific heat. It gets hot, the air down here is a little warmer and a little bit cooler up above. And since sound goes faster here, uh, where it's warmer, it tends to it tends to bend up because it's going a little slower here. It tends to bend up, so you can't yell very far in a hot day because the sound wants to leave the ground right here. On a cold day, the 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 uh, speed of sound is slower on the bottom and it's faster on the top, and it keeps it wants to keep the sound along the ground. You might notice that if you ever went camping up in the mountains and you're at a lake, sometimes you can hear people talking on the other side of the lake. They're a long ways away just because the sound just travels along the ground right there. They call that the re refraction of sound right here. We usually notice the refraction of light a lot more. If you stick a pole into a swimming pool, you notice how it bends around. That's refraction of light right here. We also get the reflection of sound. When sound bounces off, we call it an echo right there. And it's one of the main reasons why you sound so good when you're singing in the shower, because everything is just echoes in there and it sounds really nice right here. Or if you go into a new house before any curtains have been, and anything's been put on the wall, the house echoes right there. In most classrooms, they put tiles up on the ceiling that has little holes in them to trap the sound so it gets rid of the echoes right here. Okay, so there's just with some sound right there. Now, this chapter also goes through something called resonance right here. Resonance comes up all over the place in physics. One place it comes up is just pushing someone on a swing set right here. Suppose you're pushing someone on a swing set. Suppose you've never pushed anyone before, and you don't know how often to push. So you do a little experiment. You try pushing at different frequencies and see how high up they swing. This is the amplitude, how far up they swing right here. Now, if you only push, say, once every five minutes, he's not going to swing up very high. And if you're just constantly pushing like this, sometimes you're pushing when he's coming back, he's also not going to swing up very high. But if you push at just the right times, he can swing really high. And we call this a resonance effect right here. And we call this frequency that you push the resonant frequency right here. Anytime you push something that naturally shakes at a certain frequency, you push it at that same frequency, it will go crazy right here. So if you just dropped a wrench on concrete and it starts to ring, if you were to get in a speaker and shine that exact sound at that wrench, it would start ringing all by itself right here. This comes up a lot of other places if we look at why we have the blue sky right here. Here we have nitrogen, N2, in the atmosphere. Two nitrogens right here with like a little spring on them. And uh, blue light, when blue light hits this right here, it shakes it near the resonant frequency. And if it shakes it, you know, it's way over here, it shakes it like crazy. Red light, which is way over here, hardly shakes it at all right there. So, so red light kind of goes right on through, but the blue light shakes it all over the place and scatters it right there. So if you're standing right there and you look this way, you see mostly a blue sky right there. 
If we look at uh, clouds, clouds have all different size particles. And so they scatter all the colors and that's why you get white right here. If clouds were all one size particles, you could have blue clouds and green and purple and orange and so on, but they're not. They're all, they're all made up of a whole set of size particles right here. Another place you might see this resonance is in your tires right here. If you hit too many curbs, instead of your angular frequency, angular velocity going this way, it gets bent up a little bit. Your tires aren't balanced. And now as your tires roll, it kind of pushes the car. And when you get up to a certain speed, the whole car goes crazy. And you, and you either have to speed up faster or slow down right here. And so, so we, we probably speed up, right? We're not going to slow down right here. And so, the, the, or this is the washing machine. You have to move the clothes around to balance it out right there. Uh, bridges. There's a picture of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in your textbook that was built in the 1940s. And the wind, big suspension bridge, and the wind hit it at exactly its natural frequency, tore it to shreds in a few weeks right here. Matter of fact, most soldiers, when they are crossing a bridge, they have to break step. They don't want to walk together. So anytime you're walking across a bridge, look and see how everyone else is walking and walk differently right here. Okay. Now, that's resonance right here. If we look at earthquakes right here, that's a wave right there. Earthquakes emits both transverse and longitudinal waves right here. And if we look at a seismograph, it's just a big mass with three very sensitive instruments placed on top. One of them measures very sensitive movement up and down. One of them move, measures sensitive movement this way and the other one sensitive motion this way. This one, since this is the up and down, this measures the transverse wave. This one measures the longitudinal wave this way. This one measures the longitudinal wave this way. If you get them both, then it's probably coming in over this way right here. And so what do they do? When an earthquake hits, maybe this blue one will trigger first. And then a little bit later, this one will come by right here. And by the difference in the time, because they both go at different speeds, and if you know the time difference when they both got to you, you can get the distance to the earthquake from this station to the earthquake. And they have these stations all over the place. Say at a UCR, they have a station and they get an earthquake and it says it happened 50 miles away. Well, they get a map and put a little circle 50 miles away from that point. Now they got another spot, JPL, right here in Pasadena. Maybe it was only 20 miles away. They put a little circle around that. They know it's going to be the intersection of those circles. Well, that gave you two points. But if you have a third station, there's only going to be a nice, unique spot where all three of them intersect right here. And it doesn't have to be on the surface of the Earth. It could be down lower. It could be, these are really spheres and not circles right there. And so once they know where it's at, then they know how big it is because of how far away it is. So usually when an earthquake happens, you should feel the sideways motion first and then a split second later the up and down motion. So next time an earthquake happens, well, as soon as you measure this, set your stopwatch and then stop it right there. And if that's a long time difference, then you know it's a long ways away and it must have been a huge earthquake. If it's a real short time difference, that means it was nearby, it probably wasn't that big right here. Unless, unless it really felt big right here. Okay, and when they're building structures, they do not want structures have the same frequency as the earthquake. Otherwise, this resonance will just tear it down, right? Yeah, this thing will, will just tear down buildings that have the same frequency right here. If we look at radio waves, radio waves are the same as light waves right here. They're transverse waves right here, but let's stick with radio. When we transmit radio, we transmit either AM or FM. Now, with a nice sine wave, there is no information in a sine wave. We have to change something in that sine wave, right? There's no information in this wave. So, with AM, what we do is we change the amplitude. We call it amplitude modulation. That's what AM stands for. And so, you notice here, 
the amplitude is changing. The wavelength isn't changing. So if you look at a, a station, let's say uh, 840 on the AM DAB, that means 840,000 shakes per second, but they're changing the amplitude right here. That's all they're changing right here. And that's where all the information is in the amplitude changing. The AM knob goes from 540,000, they just don't put, they always put 540, but it's really 540,000 shakes per second to 1.6 million shakes per second. And then we have FM, frequency modulation. That way they're changing the frequency. You notice the waves get closer, further, closer, further, but they're all the same height. This is from 88 on the knob, 88 million, to 108 on the knob, 108 million. Since this is a higher frequency than that, the higher the frequency, the more information you can send, and you can send this in stereo. You can't send AM in stereo right there. Okay. Now, AM and FM, uh, both, uh, if we look at the Earth, here's the Earth right here, we have a layer way above the Earth. It's called the ionosphere. It's probably about 50, 50 miles up right here above our head, ionosphere. And what happens is any wavelength bigger than 15 meters just reflects. Well, AM stations are bigger than 15 meters. So they just go up and bounce right off right here. FM, they'll go right on through right here. So if you took an AM radio to the moon, it wouldn't, you wouldn't hear anything right here. This is the main reason why we put all the crazies on AM. It saves the Earth a lot of embarrassment. If we would have, if these signals got out and they heard what these people said on AM, we would have been, we would have been eaten a long time ago by UFOs right here. So, so we can sleep a little bit better right here. AM stations are usually transmitted upward, and so they come straight down because they know they're gonna reflect off of this. That's why when you go under a bridge or under power lines, you lose AM stations right here. FM, they can't shine them up because they'll just leave. The FM, they shoot them along the ground right here. But if you get on the other side of a hill or a mountain, you lose it right here. So here you can go over a mountain right here, but here you can't right there. So, so uh, this, plays a, this ionosphere plays a lot. Not only that at night, when the sun, well, in the daytime, when the sun's up, this is kind of bouncing around, doesn't reflect very well. At night, when the sun's over here, it calms down, and AM actually sounds better at night if, if, if it ever sounds good at all right here. Okay, so now if we wanted to measure the speed of light, we can do that very easily just at a stoplight right here. Because you ever notice when you're driving your car and you come to a stoplight and all of a sudden the radio goes bad, and then what do you do? You move the car a little bit and then it gets good again, right? Well, it's probably because you have the, the regular wave hitting the antenna. And then if you have some other vehicle, maybe a truck, you got the wave also bouncing off the truck and coming back in. And if this wave is going this way and that the reflected wave is the opposite, the two cancel each other out and you don't get any signal here. So what do you have to do? You have to move this a little closer so that the two waves are in phase, not out of phase right here. How much do you have to move? You have to, so what you do is when you have to move uh, one fourth uh, or whatever, one fourth of the wavelength. So what you do is at the stoplight, as soon as the light goes bad, who's ever sitting shotgun, get out, put a little piece of chalk by, by the front tire right there and then move up a little bit till it clears up and then put another mark there, measure that distance, jump in the car and you're home free. You can do that just while the light's red right there because all you have to do is take that distance, multiply it by four, that gives you the wavelength. And we know the wavelength times the frequency is the speed. Now you say, how do I get the frequency? Well, it gives you right on the radio right there. If you go to the radio, you might as well go to FM. It won't work for AM. FM. Go to 100 on the knob. Makes the math easy. But it really means 100 million. So that would be 100 million. And we probably have to move about, uh, this would be about 3. So, and the speed of light is about 300 million meters per second right there. So, 
So you can measure the speed of light or the speed of radio waves and the time it takes you at the stoplight right there. Okay, just so now you have enough information to take the test. The test will cover from way back on liquids all the way up to this right here. Okay, and again, go look at that that uh, sample test that I gave you the website for, and I would work out those those uh, uh, sample problems too. Okay.